So the question is, what went wrong here? And as some of you know, my argument is that nationalism trumps liberalism and realism trumps liberalism. And what happened here is that liberalism ran into two different buzz saws. One was nationalism and the other is uh, realism. And let me just take a few minutes to lay this out for you. Let's just talk about the Bush doctrine. The idea that the United States can invade countries and do social engineering in those countries, especially at the end of a rifle barrel, in the age of nationalism is foolish in the extreme. Nationalism is the most powerful political ideology on the planet. And it's very clear that if you invade a country like Iraq or Afghanistan, you are eventually going to go from being a liberator to being an occupier. And once you, in, once you become an occupier, nationalism kicks in and there's tremendous resistance from the people who live in this country. I learned this when I was a young boy slash man when I was in the American military. I was in the American military from 1965 to 1975, which was coterminous with the Vietnam War. Marines landed at Da Nang on March 8, 1965. I went into the Army as an enlisted man on June 22, 1965. I got out of the military, American military in August of 1975. The Vietnam War ended in the spring of 1975. And one thing I learned during those years is that we were not fighting communism in Vietnam. The reason that the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong fought like wild dogs against us was not because of communism. It was because of nationalism. They didn't want a bunch of Europeans when the French were there telling them what colored toilet paper they could use. And they didn't want us telling them what colored toilet paper they could use. They wanted to run their own politics. Right. I remember in 1979 when the Soviets invaded Afghanistan, everybody said, oh my god, this is the end of the world. The Soviets are on the march. I said exactly the opposite. The Soviet Union has just created a huge blunder. They've just invaded a country in the developing world where they're soon going to be seen as an occupier and they're going to be up to their eyeballs dealing with resistance. You want to stay out of places like Afghanistan if you're the Soviet Union or if you're the United States of America. My view is if you're arms racing or you're in a security competition with another great power, what you want to do is encourage that great power to intervene in places like Afghanistan and <laughs> Vietnam. When I first started going to China in the early 2000s, I told the Chinese, tongue in cheek of course, but. I said, what you want to do is tell the Americans that they have to win the war on terror. You're counting on them to win the war on terror, and they have to stay in Afghanistan and in Iraq until they win. I said, they'll be there forever, wrecking their military, wrecking their economy. Right? You want to stay out of those places. Right? This is why I oppose the Iraq war. Brian referenced that. Steve Walt and I and all the realists. Because the realists appreciate the importance of nationalism, most powerful political ideology on the planet. Let's talk about the Russians and the Chinese. You don't think, you don't think that Vladimir Putin got really upset at the idea that we were doing social engineering in Moscow? That Michael McFaul was going to be active with groups that were interested in turning he, Michael McFaul was the ambassador to Russia from 2012 to 2014. You don't think the Russians and Putin in particular were going to be very upset about the fact that we were trying to tinker with the Russian political system? You all follow American politics. You know how ballistic the United States goes at the mere thought that the Russians are interfering in our politics. You know what that is? That's American nationalism. That's, nationalism is all about sovereignty. We are a sovereign state. We do not like the idea of the Russians meddling in our politics. Well, as my mother taught me when I was a little boy, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. And if we don't like the Russians interfering in our politics, are you surprised that they didn't like us interfering in their politics? That's nationalism. Go to Beijing. Ask the Chinese what they think about us interfering over issues like protests in Hong Kong. They do not think for one second that we have a right to interfere and with, with what's going on in Hong Kong. You all follow this story for sure about the Houston Rockets general manager who tweeted in support of those protesters in Hong Kong. He got himself into a wall and a whole heck of a lot of trouble. Why? Nationalism. Go to China today. 
boy, the nationalism is really powerful. All of this is to say, in a world where nationalism is really powerful, if you're a crusader state and you're sticking your nose in everybody else's business, and especially if you're trying to occupy one of those countries, you are going to get yourself in a whole heap of lot of trouble. And what you want to do, again, is you want to stay out and encourage your adversaries to go in. <laughs> That's nationalism. Then there's realism. Let's just talk about Ukraine. Does anybody seriously think that you can march NATO right up to Russia's border and turn Ukraine and Georgia into Western bulwarks and the Russians are just going to sit there and take it? That, that they're going to understand that we're a benign hegemon? This is not the way international politics works. Just take the United States of America. We have the Monroe Doctrine. Right. The Monroe Doctrine says that no country in the Western Hemisphere is allowed to invite a distant great power into this hemisphere and form a military alliance with it and put military forces in the hemisphere. Do you think the United States, let's, let's hypothesize the situation, it's 20 years from now, China forms a close relationship with Canada and Mexico. They form a military alliance, and the Chinese decide that they're going to deploy some military forces in Canada and in Mexico. You, you think the United States is going to say, Canada's a sovereign country, Mexico's a sovereign country, and they can do whatever they want? If you believe that, you are really asking for trouble. If you show any interest, in forming a military alliance or getting too close to the Chinese, the Americans will be on top of you like nobody's business. You remember the, there's enough old dogs in this room who remember the Cuban Missile Crisis. Fidel Castro had the audacity to form a military alliance with Cuba, then invite them, excuse me, to form a military alliance with the Soviet Union, then invite the Soviets to put missiles in Cuba. We still have not recovered from that. You notice that we still have our gun sights on Cuba. Oh, that just drove us crazy. That's a violation of the Monroe Doctrine. Again, you know my rhetoric about what's good for the goose is good for the gander. You're surprised that the Russians were upset about NATO expansion? And it was not just NATO expansion. It was NATO expansion plus EU expansion plus the color revolutions. And you know, a lot of people say to me, don't you understand, John, that Ukraine is a sovereign state and it can choose its own foreign policy. To which my response is, that's a foolish way of thinking about international politics. If you're a small state and you live next door to a gorilla, you have to be really very careful what you do. Because if you make that gorilla angry, that gorilla is going to do all sorts of horrible things to you. And we basically, probably unintentionally, encouraged Ukraine to pursue policies that got into a heap of trouble. And then when they got into a heap of trouble, what did we do? Nothing. We led them down the primrose path. And we did the same thing with Georgia. The Georgians were expecting us to come to the rescue. They're expecting the 7th Cavalry, Cavalry to arrive. It didn't happen. Surprise of surprises. But anyway, all I'd say is you got to understand basic realpolitik here. All right.